biological functoids are actually probably one of the most difficult to get a, an understanding of. Um, the, the key to it to me is that you always use it in conjunction with this advanced functoid down here called value mapping. So if you look at the value mapping functoid, we open it and we look at it and it says it must have exactly two parameters. And we have to read this to really understand it. Use the value mapping functoid to return a value from one of two different input parameters. If the value of the first input is true, then the value of the second parameter is returned. This functoid requires two parameters. If your destination schema is flat, use the value mapping flattening functoid instead of this one. So there's actually two functoids here. Um, I've never actually been able to create an illustration that shows the difference between the two, but I know there is a slight difference. Um, so let's say we use this one because over here we have a very flat world. And <clears throat> let's say for instance, you'll see examples of this actually in the lab we're going to do. But when you, you do this, the first thing you do is you need like something equals something. So let's say for instance, what if the value of the car is greater than $10,000? So we'll take the greater than sign and we'll drag the car to it and then we look and add a constant of say ten thousand dollars okay so if that car is greater than ten thousand then you're gonna map the value true or false to this functoid here and it says here the value of the first functoid if it's true then it's gonna use the second functoid so <clears throat> let's just say for instance we copy this value here and now let's copy it over here and this isn't the real meaning what we would be what we're doing right now is saying for instance if the car is over 10,000 then copy it here if it's under 10,000 let's set this to zero so what we would do then is add a, a less than or equal to 10,000 and then put the number 10,000 in here Then we need another flattening functoid. So if that's true, we want to then move the value. How about the word cheap car? Okay, that's kind of a silly example. But so if it's over 10,000, it'll print the value. If it's under 10,000, it'll actually print the word cheap car here. And to make this work, this really should not be a numeric field. So just to really do this then let's make it an let's use up some other field that we know is alpha fields so let's use the spouse's name okay then we're going to test this map so first of all let's look at our data our car is worth six thousand car number one so now back to our map right click test map Go to the output, scroll to the right, and do the control click, and you can see it is cheap car. Now if we changed our data and made this 10,001, and then we do test map again over here, Ooh, we still got cheap car. double check everything. Um, there's 10,001. Let's hit save. Make sure we saved it. Let's go back to our map. Let's check a couple of the numbers here. So I'm going to use the uh, grid preview here to get this centered again. So here if it's less than or equal to 10,000 <coughs> then Oh, this is what's bad. Uh, well, our car value is a decimal. The question is, is it doing a string compare or is it really doing a numeric compare? I have a feeling it's actually doing a numeric. So if it's greater than 10,000, then it should be setting this to true and it should be moving the car value over here. So let's just try it again. And 
for some reason we're still getting cheap car. So that could mean two things. Either both of these are true. So could the less than be true? And then it's overriding the first one. So let's check that out. Okay, I'll show you another way we could test this. Um, we're going to put the two faults there. Now it's a numeric field. I don't want to put it there. Okay, here's two names I know are alpha fields. Let's take the true faults of the greater than there and the true faults of the less than here. And let's see if they're both true or they're both false or what, are, what the right combination is. So we'll say test them out. So obviously something's not working here. It's like it's not using my current data or something. So again, I'm going to do a build. Sometimes that fixes what I call goofy problems. There's no errors. So now let's test the map again. <clears throat> the other thing I guess we need to check is when we test the map, let's make sure there's not any errors in here, which I'm afraid that's what happened. So all of these are just warnings. Warning, 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 warning. Warning, warning. I don't see an error, so let's go to the test map failure. Make sure I'm opening the right file. It says the output is stored. Oops, I see an invalid right there. The element loan work is invalid child element spouse name. But I don't think that's going to hurt. But apparently it is. Okay, so there's another trick here. When you do a test map, oops, that's not what I meant to do. When you right click on properties before you do a test map, sorry, I'm on the right map. Right click properties. Well, I think there's the problem. That's maybe just too obvious. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what it was doing here was generating an instance. And I've done this before. So, generate instance, we've done before. If, you, if you're on a schema and you right click uh, generate instance, it'll just create dummy data. So, what you need to do here is make sure you're actually testing with your real test data. So, let me go get the name of my test file here loan application one and let's go to the properties of the map and put that in here and now we'll test the map and now you can see you got here the thousand and one ten thousand one um, one other little trick here is to avoid these errors and stuff um, you can right click properties and you can say here don't validate the output or the input for that matter so by setting both of these defaults it makes your map a little bit more lenient okay so let's close that and let's test it again so where it used to get errors now you won't get as many errors and that didn't seem to have any impact either did it so in general, this raises another interesting question is, in the real world, how do you debug your maps? And you can see here it's not always that easy. Now, Visual Studio 2005 did include an XSLT debugger, and maybe we'll look at that in another video. Um, what I've done in the past is, if my map is very complex, I'll actually write it in XSLT, and then I'll, um, BizTalk can actually reference external XSLT maps. So we'll look at that also in a future video. Um, I used to use a product, or still use a product, called Stylus Studio, and it includes an XSLT debugger built into it. So I can actually walk through my XSLT code and fix it, and then when I get it working, I come over here and copy it in. So it all kind of depends on the complexity of your map and how well you know XSLT versus whether you prefer using these functoids as to how you want to debug your map.